Hello, today we introduce, read and analyze Gulliver's Travels Magic the Swift. This is one of the first novels of the 18th century in England. It was published in 1726 and it consists of four books. Each book is about a different travel. In book one, we see the protagonist called Gulliver, who sails in 1699 towards the South Pacific but is cast upon the shore of an island called Lilliput. In Lilliput, the inhabitants are very, very small and in comparison is a huge, is a giant, but is to return to England. In Book 2, Gulliver sails again, this time for India, and he finds himself in a place called Brobdingnag, that is possibly located near Alaska. This time, Gulliver is very, very small in comparison to the inhabitants of the place that are for him giants. He is at the end of his journey is rescued by a ship and returns to England for the second time. Gulliver's ship is attacked by pirates and he arrives at a place of a flying island called Laputa. Laputa is a Spanish, Puta is prostitute, so the prostitute, and we're going to see why it's called the prostitute. This is a place where there are scientists who have crazy ideas. Um, then he, he leaves the island and, and he arrives in Japan and then he goes back to England. In the fourth and last travel he finds a place inhabited by the so-called Oims. These are horses, intelligent horses, that are controlling, governing a place where there is a, a race of beings similar to human beings and these are called yahoos and uh, these yahoos are really savages uh, let's have a historical background about uh, the reason why Jonathan Swift wrote Gulliver's Travels it's not only a story of adventure there's also a criticism an attack on uh, human nature and uh, a political party the Whigs why did Swift attack the Whigs well, actually, it was something very personal. He tried to join the, the Whigs, the party of the Whigs, but uh, it was refused. And so, Swift turned to the opposing party, the Tories, and, and so, uh, in the Gulliver's Travels, he describes the follies, the stupidity of this party. Now, this book was quite a success, and the readers try to identify uh, each character that had been uh, described in a satirical way with uh, a real person in the political scene of the time. Uh, we are in the age of reason. Uh, we saw in Defoe a person who is uh, really confident in the use of reason to solve problems, to survive, to improve his own condition. Swift has a different idea as he's going to show in his journeys, in his travels, man through reason can be insane. Science in particular, and let's not forget that in uh, the previous century he was founded the Royal Society and Newton was one of the founders uh, for the uh, development of science and um, Swift criticizes science in such a way that it appears ridiculous as we're going to see in the journey to Laputa. If we have to understand the Gulliver's travel, we have to have in mind an object. It's called a spyglass. Spyglass is a, an optical device that allows us to look at things far away and see them close. But if you turn the other way around the spyglass, then instead of seeing things magnified, things distant magnified, you see the opposite. You see things that are reduced to very little tiny objects. So changing the spyglass, you change the point of view and things appear. The same things appear. Different. We're going to see two extras, one from book two uh, from the island of Brodignac and one from book three from the, island, from the island of Laputa. The nurse, to quiet her babe, made use of a rattle which was a kind of hollow vessel filled with great stones and fastened by a cable to the child's waist, but all in vain. 
so that she was forced to apply the last remedy by giving it suck. I must confess no object ever disgusted me so much as the sight of her monstrous breast, which I cannot tell what to compare with, so as to give the curious reader an idea of its bulk, shape, and colour. It stood prominent six feet, and could not be less than sixteen in circumference. The nipple was about half the bigness of my head, and the hue both of that and the dug so varied with spots, pimples, and freckles, that nothing could appear more nauseous. For I had a near sight of her, she sitting down, the more conveniently to give suck, and I standing on the table. We are in the island of the child, and the caliphor is, there is more, in the same room of a nurse, and she has a baby, she's taking care of a baby, but this baby is a child for Gallagher, and um, she tries, the nurse, to quiet the baby. Uh, how with, uh, you know, a toy, a rattle, that is an object, we know that uh, is an object that makes some noise inside this. There are little balls, uh, like as big as a rice, but uh, in this story, because is the proportion of things is different, this rattle is a very big one, and the string is a cable, very thick one. But in vain, the baby continued to cry, so the nurse had only one last resort. She gave her breast some milk to the baby. She fed the baby. Gallifer was very close to the nurse, so when the nurse uncovered her breast to give it to the baby, he saw it in all its magnificent, in all its size. And, the, and his breast is described as monstrous. Why monstrous? Because it was, you know, it's, it's like when you take a lens and you see even your skin, if you watch your skin with a lens, it appears not as beautiful as it is from a distance. So, the breast of this woman is described in physical, realistic detail, in bulk, shape and color. It was six feet quite large and sixteen in circumference. The nipple, that is the central part of the breast, was half as he is at, and the color was uh, varied. There were spots, pimples, freckles, all imperfections of the skin. And it was so close that the sight was nauseous, it was disgusting. This made me reflect upon the fair skins of our English ladies, who appear so beautiful to us, only because they are of our own size, and their defects not to be seen but through a magnifying glass, where we find, by experiment, that the smoothest and whitest skins look rough and coarse and ill-coloured. I remember, when I was at Lilliput, the complexion of those diminutive people appeared to me the fairest in the world. And talking upon this subject with a person of learning there, who was an intimate friend of mine, he said that my face appeared much fairer and smoother when he looked on me from the ground than it did upon a nearer view, when I took him up in my hand and brought him close which he confessed was at first a very shocking sight. He said, He could discover great holes in my skin, that the stumps of my beard were ten times stronger than the bristles of a boar, and my complexion made up several colours altogether disagreeable. Although I must beg leave to say for myself, that I am as fair as most of my sex and country, and very little sunburnt by all my travels. On the other side, Discoursing of the ladies of that emperor's court, he used to tell me, One had freckles, another too wide a mouth, a third too large a nose. Nothing of which I was able to distinguish. I confess this reflection was obvious enough, which, however, I could not forbear, lest the reader might think those vast creatures were actually deformed. For I must do them the justice to say, they are a comely race of people and particularly the features of my master's countenance, although he was but a farmer, when I beheld him from the height of sixty feet, appeared very well proportioned. 
after the realistic description of the breast of the nurse, now there is the second step, reflection. So first physical input, then reflection on your physical observation. And what is so made him reflect on the fact that the skin of uh, the English leg, that uh, in general are considered beautiful skins, appears so only for one simple reason, because they are seen from a distance. But if you could take a magnifying glass and watch the skin very, very closely, we would, uh, by experiment, uh, see that what uh, should have been, should appear as a, a white, perfect skin from a distance, in reality is rough, coarse and ill-colored, full of imperfections. And then he continues reflecting about himself when he was in Lilliput. Lilliput, he was a giant and the inhabitants were very, very small. And so from a this to his eyes, the inhabitants of Lilliput appeared very, very nice, very beautiful, because he was from a distance. And also one of them, a little person, told him that the skin of Gulliver, seen from a distance, from far away, appeared to be fairer and smoother. But when he took the person near his face to talk to him, he, he confessed that uh, the skin, his skin, appeared to the Lilliputian a shocking sight because it was very, very close. In fact, you could see, like when you use a magnifying glass, great holes in my skin. And the beard, the growing beard, was very, very thick. And the color of my skin was disagreeable. Kalea uh, must confess that his skin is like the skin of many other people. It's normal for him. So what, if, what appears normal at a certain distance, if you change the point of view, then it can appear in a very completely different way. And also, he remembers that the ladies he saw, the court of the emperor of Lilip, their skin, their faces, their skins, they appear to be perfect. But his friend could see them closer to all. Gulliver had one had freckles, another had two wide mouths, a third two large nose, all in perfection, they were not visible from a distance. So what is the lesson here? The lesson is that we have uh, cultural prejudices, we believe in things, and we believe certain things because of our point of view. But if we change the point of view, we can change our ideas. What do we believe to be beautiful, fair, and, and so on, can be seen in a different way if we change the point of view. It's like, and it's very simple, you just have to change the point of view. And if you see things close, uh, very, very near, then you can see all imperfection. And you can apply this uh, idea to everything, to an idea, to a situation, to everything. Everything can be considered beautiful and positive and wonderful at a from a distance. But if you analyze very, very closely, then you can see all the imperfection it has. And so, in the end, we have a relative way. Knowledge is relative. You have our ideas are relative. Depends on our point of view. The sum of his discourse was to this effect, that about forty years ago certain persons went up to Laputa, either upon business or diversion, and, after five months' continuance, came back with a very little smattering in mathematics, but full of volatile spirits acquired in that airy region that these persons, upon their return, began to dislike the management of everything below, and fell into schemes of putting all arts, sciences, languages, and mechanics upon a new foot. To this end they procured a royal patent for erecting an academy of projectors in Legado, and the humour prevailed so strongly among the people that there is not a town of any consequence in the kingdom without such an academy. In these colleges the professors contrive new rules and methods of agriculture and building, and new instruments and new tools for all trades and manufacturers, whereby, as they undertake, one man shall do the work of ten, a palace may be built in a week, of material so durable as to last for ever without repairing. All the fruits of the earth shall come to maturity at whatever season we think fit to choose, and increase a hundredfold more than they do at present with innumerable other happy proposals. 
The only inconvenience is that none of these projects are yet brought to perfection, and in the meantime the whole country lies miserably waste, the houses in ruin, and the people without food or clothes. The author is permitted to see the Grand Academy of Legado, the academy largely described, the arts wherein the professors employ themselves. This academy is not an entire single building, but a continuation of several houses on both sides of a street, which, growing waste, was purchased and applied to that use. I was received very kindly by the warden, and went for many days to the academy. Every room has in it one or more projectors, and I believe it could not be in fewer than five hundred rooms. Let's see now, book three. Now, Gulliver is in a new place, in a flying island called Laputa. There is uh, in this island an academy of scientists. Why was it created? Because the, the scientists decided to put all sciences together in such a way as to create uh, the, a development, a new, a new science. And so they created this place, this academy. Now, this academy was uh, designed, was uh, built with the intention of improve everyday life. The only inconvenience is that uh, now of the hundreds of projects that were um, experimented, carried out in this academy, was brought uh, to perfection, so they were still incomplete. And in the meantime, the whole country was miserable, was uh, the houses were in ruins, people without food and clothes, so instead of receiving the benefits of science, they were paying the price of financing the academy. Gulliver was uh, received permission to visit the academy, and he was taken to tour of the academy by the warden. This academy was very large. In every room there was one or more projectors, more scientists, and there were hundreds, at least 500 rooms. So can you imagine, at least 500 rooms, 500 scientists, each one working on a different project. Apparently, we have the impression that it is a, a great enterprise. 500 different projects, but none of them has ever been completed. And let's see now some examples, some extras from his tour. The first man I saw was of a meagre aspect, with sooty hands and face, his hair and beard long, ragged, and singed in several places. His clothes, shirt, and skin were all of the same colour. He had been eight years upon a project for extracting sunbeams out of cucumbers, which were to be put in vials, hermetically sealed, and let out to warm the air in raw, inclement summers. He told me, he did not doubt, that in eight years more, he should be able to supply the governor's gardens with sunshine, at a reasonable rate. But he complained that his stock was low, and entreated me, to give him something as an encouragement to ingenuity, especially since this had been a very dear season for cucumbers. I made him a small present, for my lord had furnished me with money on purpose, because he knew their practice of begging from all who go to see them. I went into another chamber, but was ready to hasten back, being almost overcome with a horrible stink. My conductor pressed me forward, conjuring me in a whisper, to give no offence, which would be highly resented, and therefore I durst not so much as stop my nose. The projector of this cell was the most ancient student of the academy. His face and beard were of a pale yellow, his hands and clothes dubbed over with filth. When I was presented to him, he gave me a close embrace, a compliment I could well have excused. His employment, from his first coming into the academy, was an operation to reduce human excrement to its original food, by separating the several parts, removing the tincture which it receives from the gall, making the odour exhale, and scumming off the saliva. He had a weekly allowance from the society of a vessel filled with human orger, about the bigness of a Bristol barrel. I saw another at work to calcine ice into gunpowder, who likewise showed me a treatise he had written concerning the malleability of fire, 
which he intended to publish. There was a most ingenious architect, who had contrived a new method for building houses, by beginning at the roof, and working downwards to the foundation, which he justified to me, by like the practice of those two prudent insects, the bee and the spider. There was a man born blind, who had several apprentices in his own condition. Their employment was to mix colours for painters, which their master taught them to distinguish by feeling and smelling. It was indeed my misfortune to find them at that time not very perfect in their lessons. And the professor himself happened to be generally mistaken. The first man he saw was a meagre aspect, not very fat, and his beard was long, ragged, not, uh, not uh, taken care of, and seemed to burn in some place, and also his clothes and skin were the same color. He has been for eight years, can you imagine, eight years, upon a single project, so it must be something important. What is it, this project? He, he tried to extract sun beams, the light of the sun, out of cucumbers, a vegetable, and then pull, extract the light, the energy of the sun from the vegetables, put them into containers, and uh, open this container to warm the air like a warming system when the summers were not quite warm. You see, this is a, there's a logic. What comes in should come out. If a person goes into a room, you open the door and it can go out. So, if uh, the light, the energy of the sun enters a vegetable plant, it should be logical to take the same energy back out of the plant, of the vegetable, or the cucumber in this case. There's only one problem. And as we know in chemistry, there are reactions that are reversible. For example, water. Water can become ice, can become steam, and then back to water. So the reaction is reversible. But there are some reactions, some transformation that are not reversible. The moment they are transformed into something else, they cannot be turned back into the original element, condition, state. And then uh, this scientist asking some money to buy more cucumbers. And so, you see, now why probably we have the name Naputa? Because this scientist is, uh, you know, selling, is asking for money in order to uh, carry out his experiment. Now you might, you might think, well, today when we think of science, we think probably of, you know, the researchers at some university. And we think of those researchers as uh, abstract thinking, as uh, not connected to money. But it's not like this. If you are a researcher at university, you need money, somebody to finance your researches. In general, these are private companies. So they pay you, the scientists, to have a research for their own benefit. So scientists here are considered like a prostitute who sell themselves for money. This is a possible interpretation, of course. They visit another chamber, another room. Before entering this room, the guide told Gulliver, please uh, uh, give no offense, be careful. Uh, but the smell from inside the room was so strong that he had to, you know, stop his nose to avoid smelling what came out of the room. Now, the scientist, the projector of this uh, room was the most ancient of the academy. So we should expect to be a very important, incredible project. Now, let's see his, his condition. His face and beer were a kind of yellow, and also his hands and clothes were dirty, the same color. The scientists wanted to embrace him. It was a compliment he tried to avoid. You know, this person was so dirty. And now we understand the source of his dirt. His employment, from the first moment he entered the academy, was to reduce human excrement to its original food, separate the different parts, removing, you know, what is produced in the gall, 
the liquid that helps the, to digest food, uh, removing the smell and removing the saliva that we introduce in the mouth. And he received uh, every week a, a barrel, a big container of ordure, of excrement, of human excrement. So you see, also in this case, the same logic. Logically, if you start from food, and food is transformed into excrement, why not do the reverse operation from the excrement recreate the original food? So if you eat some spaghetti with tomato sauce and cheese, you can take your, the excrements and recreate the cheese, the spaghetti, the tomato sauce. Logically, it is uh, okay, rational, logical process, but is not realistic because the moment you eat food, you are starting an irreversible process that cannot be brought back. And, uh, and then he went to another room and saw somebody trying to create gunpowder. Gunpowder is what is necessary to shoot a gun or a cannon uh, from ice. Or oh, he was also trying to uh, write something about the malleability of fire, how to, you know, change the shape of fire. Also, this is a quite useless research. Uh, and then there was a, another scientist who tried to build houses, not from the bottom, from the foundations, but from the roof, from the last part. Why? Because he saw that uh, some insects did just like that. The bees, the spiders, they used to start from one part and move on to the bottom. Uh, and so he wanted to imitate them. Of course, if you try to build a house from the roof, the roof will fall down. It would be impossible. And then he went to another room. And this time, the scientist was born blind. So he could not yet, never had an experience of uh, cine color and he wanted to mix colors for painters and distinguish them not by sight because he was blind but by feeling by touching them and smelling unfortunately when he was in this room caliber uh, observed uh, the failure of uh, this experiment because no matter how many times the scientists tried to guess the right color he always faked. Now let's see some themes that are present in this uh, novel. One is uh, the physical power on the one hand and the moral righteousness on the other. Initially he is uh, entrapped, he is forced to obey, to follow the, uh, the inhabitants of the uh, first island and the second island, because in the first case he was captured by the Liputians, in the second he was enslaved by former who found him. Um, and also in the last island, white horses, the Hoins, chained, imprisoned the Hoins. So here you have, in his travels, the presence of uh, those in power who force the others to obey because they are stronger. But uh, on the other side, there are also those who have power because they believe to have the moral right to have the power. For example, in the first dollar there is a whole discussion, the political debate between Lilliput against the, the other states in the island, Blefusk, is based on uh, the, the correct interpretation of uh, their holy book. So the difference in the interpretation of a holy book is the reason of the war between these two states. And also in the last island, the Huims um, enslave the Yahoos because the white horses, the intelligent horses, believe they have a moral superiority. They are clean, they are behaved, they are more rational this, than these savage Yahoos who look like human beings. But in the end, uh, this righteousness, this belief in being the one with the correct and most moral idea is arbitrary because sometimes you see that one or the other are equivalent. 
Now, Gulliver's Island was uh, one of the first novels to describe a upside down utopia, a dystopia. A utopia, as you know, is a, an imaginary model of the ideal community. Community is important because everybody helps the others uh, to, you know, to create a true solidarity, a stable and supportive state. But uh, Gulliver's Travels, instead of describing a world of solidarity, a utopic world, describes a world of alienation. The protagonist cannot integrate himself in all the different societies that he happens to visit. Not even his uh, homeland, England, he feels like a homeland. He feels like a faraway place. No desire, no, no nostalgia for, the, for England. And as soon as he returns home, he wants to live again. Let's see some of the motives, the recurrent contrasts that are present in the story. One is uh, the material needs of people, in this case the escort. Now, apparently is something that should make us laugh, but there is a philosophical um, significance in the continuous reference to escort. It means that we are not just uh, or, you know, mental, spiritual beings. We have only a body. And it doesn't matter if we don't want to consider the body, it, it's a reality. So, 18th century, there was a tendency, a rational tendency, to forget the human needs, the bodily needs, uh, the physical needs we have, because it was considered a field, dirty. But uh, what happens? It happens, that, for example, in the first journey, when there was a fire in the castle of the king, Gulliver. He didn't know what to do, so what did he do? He just uh, urinates uh, to extinguish the fire with the shock, the surprise of the king who was wet with the urine coming from Gulliver. Or when in Laputa they tried to recycle, recreate from the excrements the original food. Let's look about the protagonist. First of all, the name Gulliver. Does Gulliver mean? Gulliver can fit to two things. Gulliver is a person who puts inside his mouth food. And Gulliver also referred to a seagull, a bird. This bird was not believed to be very intelligent. In fact, if you say gullible, gullible, it means a person believes everything you, you say to him, you tell him. Now, is he a hero? If you watch him through all the travels, he doesn't look like a hero. It is not because he's a coward. No, no, quite the opposite. He's quite brave. He survives in many difficult situations. But um, there's no mission, no drive in his uh, adventures. His missions have no sense. If you think, for example, of um, Odysseus. Odysseus, you know, started the journey, but then he wants to go back to his home and so all other great uh, heroes of the past. Gulliver also is a gullible person. He believes everything they tell him. He doesn't understand some things that happen around him. He undergoes some transformation. Initially, he's a naive, like a childish English man, and then, and then he starts his journey and he learns so many things. But at the end of it, especially after the experience with the white horses, he becomes disillusioned, like a misanthrope, but it is a person that he refuses to enjoy the community of people. He wants to be on his own. When he goes back for the last time to England, he prefers to spend time in the stables with the horses than with his family. In conclusion, we can say that Gallipus' travel is not just an adventure book for children, it has also some philosophical messages. One of the most important ones is that uh, everything we know is relative, and uh, if we just change the point of view, we can see things differently. Now, in our world, in our world, uh, we have so many cultural prejudices, probably because we live in our home, 
and we receive information that is being created just for us. But if we could travel, travel the world and live in different places, different cultures, probably we would not consider those cultures in the same way as we do now. From a distance, because if you are in a different place, living in a different culture, and you see very closely things that are not visible from a distance. So this book, even if it was um, one of the reasons of, the, of this book was to attack a political party of this uh, period, uh, today we, it can be seen as a, an invitation to have less, fewer prejudices and to be open to alternative interpretations of the same thing like in the passage about the nurse, where what appeared to be beautiful was, if you see it very closely with the lens, not so beautiful at all. And also not to depend on reason, because the reason sometimes can be insane, as we can see in his modest proposal, where reason, logic, is used to propose a solution, an insane solution to a real problem. That's it. Thank you.